This is Hemet. And Jessica. And you're listening to the Friendly Atheist Podcast. Please go to patreon.com slash friendly atheist podcast to support the show. We have many things to discuss. Oh, yeah? Oh, it'll be fun. How are you mm-hmm. feeling? Everyone wants to... Everyone's very concerned about you. Are they, you doing better from last no, week? No, I mean, no. I, we <laughs> lost another horse, unfortunately. Um, it's the pits. It, it was a border horse. It was somebody's personal horse, which is like a different flavor of terrible because she's had him for like 15 years and it, it was miserable. So anyway... Things still bad on the Greif family front, but thank you for your hashtag thoughts and prayers. Well, I hope things get better. Mm-hmm. Um, I will cheer you up with with all sorts of things here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to start this week by talking once again about our friend Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, because of... I, I've been very amused for the past week. I mean, everything is awful with him. Mm-hmm. I've been very amused watching... Mainstream media pundits, commentators, they're very shocked by how openly Christian nationalist this guy is. But it means they're all hearing about David Barton, the pseudo historian, for like the first time. They're like, this guy likes this dude named David Barton. And did you all know he's really messed up and lies to everyone? It's like, yes, I I have known this for a while. Oh, do you think we're going to get into a situation like with Trump where he could have just like stayed quiet and nobody would have ever scrutinized him? But now he's about to shine a spotlight on his particular brand of cuckoo bananas. Yes. He and his wife had a podcast. Oh. Uh, 69 episodes. Nice. And they took it all down real fast. Not before it was saved by everybody. Everybody. But like that's, yes, it's the scrutiny doesn't make him look good. It's him and his wife discussing Jesus shit for episodes and episodes and politics. But again, they just took it down because they don't, I don't think they're ready for the scrutiny. It's also been interesting to hear uh, commentators are like, did you all know this guy supports like this creationist theme park in Kentucky? Oh, it's like, my friend, no. we've been discussing this for many years. The national welcome. spotlight is upon you. Yeah, welcome to the club. Anyway, there's one aspect of it, though, of Mike Johnson's likes and life and everything mm. that is getting scrutiny that I've really enjoyed because I don't think people realize how batshit crazy it is. And it's beyond the typical church-state separation stuff because okay. it's not about creationism or whatnot. It is his marriage to his wife, Kelly Johnson, Uh-oh. because it's not a marriage like a typical marriage. It's a special marriage called a covenant marriage. And it's better than everyone else's marriages. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Okay, can I just make a prediction? Yes. She was underage when she committed to this person. I'm not... Uh, that's a fair guess because that does happen in some evangelical circles. But we don't have proof that this was the situation. That's not the this. case okay, here. hit me. But uh, here's the backstory about this covenant marriage thing. In 1997... Uh, when conservative Christians were all up on every culture war thing you could imagine, and they see rising... 97? 97. They see rising divorce rates. Mm. Conservatives in Louisiana passed a law that give couples, I mean, straight couples, the option of choosing a covenant marriage under the law. You can have a regular marriage, and that's fine. Nothing changes. Or you can choose... It's either or, it's not a both and? Correct. Okay. You can have your regular marriage, but if you want to up it, yeah. you can have you, a covenant you don't marriage. Be a fucking dork. Yes. And in essence, this is a marriage contract with stricter rules because unlike the marriage of normies, this one would be a lot harder to break. This marriage contract would be a lot harder to break. Um, and I'm, I'm going to tell you what it consists of in a bit. And when you say, I, I just really want to just put a pin into it's really hard to break uh-huh. for both parties. Is yes. it equally easy for both parties Correct. to break it's, it? It's not that it's bad specifically for women. No, it's it's hard for both people okay. to break it. So, but inevitably, that's going to hurt women more. Obviously, because patriarchy. Yes. So like more than anything, this is really just a way for conservative Christians to send a message that their marriages, because they choose covenant marriages, are stronger than all the rest of you peoples. That's what this is really all about, having this option on the table. I guess I just am confused about what the goal is. Th- that's the goal. To have it's the to best show marriage divorces, guy? divorce rates are up. Why? Because we allow anyone to get married. But if you love Jesus and you're pressured to choose a covenant marriage, your union will be stronger 
and it'll be a lot harder for you to get divorced. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to protect we're trying the to trap family. People into marriages, even if it becomes clear that the that's relationship where I'm going is with not this. viable or even dangerous for one that's of the parties. That's where I'm so going with the this. Parties, so we, and Nancy. here's what the rules of covenant marriage are. Again, this was passed as a law in Louisiana in '97, mm-hmm. where you have the option of choosing this. Any couple that enters into a covenant marriage, mm-hmm. they are required to go through premarital counseling which, all right, whatever. They're probably Jesus counselors, but like, they don't have to be. More importantly, though, the only way they're allowed to end their marriage is if there is an instance of adultery, abuse, abandonment, or a lengthy separation. So, if someone... It sounds like all regular reasons that people get divorced all the time. With one very big exception to the rule. Which one was it? I don't love you anymore. Uh, uh, so if you're unhappy in your marriage... Oh, that's not enough. That's not enough anymore. So what, what do they call it? Mutual... Mutual... Uh, Are you talking about the celebrity one? Like yeah, conscious what is it called? Uncoupling? Not conscious uncoupling. That was Gwyneth Paltrow's nonsense. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. irreconcilable differences. Right. Because they're trying to stop <laughs> no-fault divorces here. I pulled that from the attic of my brain. I mean, the law in pretty much any state right now is if you want to get a divorce, all that has to happen is one of you says, I want one a divorce. divorce yeah. And the the law side of things says, all right, fine. Sucks then suck. you, that it's It's on you. Yeah, Maybe true. we have uh, a lawyer figure out who gets what and you got to work that out. But in general, but that's among the we're not going to... Yeah, that's between the couple. We're not going to get in the way if you want to get a divorce. The covenant marriage says, no, unless there's a really good reason and by really good reason, they set out to define those right off the bat. Right. You are stuck in the marriage. And if you're not in love with each other, and if you just want out of the marriage, you can't leave. Cool. Now, for other reasons, so you mentioned, like you suggested, is they're going to trap someone in. Mm -hmm. Well, if they're in an abusive relationship, no, the covenant marriage, you can still get out of it. If there's uh, adultery going on, or your husband disappears and you can't find him anymore, or vice versa, or the wife disappears... You can leave for those reasons. But if you're just unhappy, nope. Yeah, you were raising your hand. Hey, they say um, if abuse is occurring, yes. is there any chance that they have the same definition of abuse that I have? I wondered about that myself. Thank there you. is no definition of abuse, but I did not find anything that said, like, if it's emotionally abusive or if it's physically abusive, but like this, it doesn't uh, count. I didn't see anything like that. They just say abuse. Okay. So if a person says there is abuse... They can get out of this. Because if you are, say, I don't know, hypothetically a religion that doesn't believe a man can rape his wife, then your definition of abuse is probably going to be pretty different than mine. And again, because it just says abuse in the law itself, and because they cannot bring religion into it, I feel like if someone just said, I am the victim of abuse... That would count. However, keep Have in mind... Have you been in the world for long? No. Because uh, that never works. Sure, sure, sure. If, but if that happens, they could get out of this contract. However, you're assuming that a partner in this union would be willing to go to government officials, some authority, and say... I am the victim of abuse, which is not an easy thing to ask anybody for and because a again, lot of people don't want to do that. Maybe they're prevented from doing that for a variety of reasons, or they're afraid that if I say this, this will have repercussions. I mean, this is just a a lifelong version of why didn't you fight back harder? Yeah. Of yeah. like, oh, you're in an abusive relationship. The The onus is on you and only you to fix this situation. And don't worry, if you do have the courage to go tell an authority figure, they probably won't believe you. And even if they do believe you, they'll probably side with your husband anyway. So, so you're, you're pointing out a lot of the issues people have brought up about covenant marriages. Mm. But the idea here, the idea here is that We just don't want to make it easy for people to Mm -hmm. get a divorce. So the Johnsons, Mike Johnson and his wife, they were married in 1999, a couple years after this law went into effect. Mm -hmm. But when all the articles started coming out about covenant marriage and stuff like that in Louisiana, they were pretty much the spokespeople in favor of it. They were the most, one of the most prominent couples to get hitched under the new law. Uh, Johnson was a law student at the time. Are there benefits? Benefits or just 
it's just in just your head. An extra ribbon gets pinned to your chest. Yes, that's exactly it. And it only works in church. Like it doesn't matter to the outside world. You just feel better about your union. So, like, at the time, Johnson was a law student. He helped draft the law. You know Tony Perkins, the hate group leader Mm -hmm. for Liberty Council? Mm -hmm. He was then a Louisiana state legislator. He's the guy who wrote the law and got it passed. And one of the things then 28-year-old Mike Johnson said at the time, in my generation, all we've ever known is the no-fault scheme. Talking about divorces. Scheme. The scheme. And any deviation from that seems like a radical move. And because so few people have chosen covenant marriage in Louisiana, it seems like an unpopular choice. It's not unpopular. It's just unknown. Once the message is out there, a whole lot more people will choose it. To what end? That they'll have stronger marriages and, like, they'll come to church. That's, I think, where they're going with this. Okay, so if these people are only into, like, strong marriages as, like, the foundation of humanity, Mm -hmm. what are we saying about... Republicans who are, I don't know, say thrice divorced. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Maybe raped one of their wives while they were. Mm-hmm. And other people. Pregnant or, yeah. Or, or doesn't, uh, doesn't matter. Or, I don't know, say you left your wife who was on her deathbed for another wife. <gasps> ooh, ooh. That was Newt Gingrich. Newt Gingrich. Yeah. yeah. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter because hypocrisy doesn't play into religious right I guess, rhetoric. I guess those are the things that I find really puzzling is the, well, no, I shouldn't because they compartmentalize and all that shit. Republicans I, are all for strong, straight marriages unless they're to like relatives. Unless there's... Unless it gets in the way of everything you want, in which case, eh, who cares? We'll just look the other way. It, it's very... It's all of a piece, because it's all the same thing as the woman who's a protester at Planned Parenthood and then brings her daughter in to get an abortion because you don't mm-hmm. understand our They're called pastors. They're called pastors. That was pretty good. Yeah. I, I, I just find... I find the hypocrisy to be uh, particularly appalling. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, Johnson, Mike Johnson at the time, mm-hmm. got a covenant marriage. He was a spokesperson in favor of it. The mm-hmm. idea in Louisiana was if we can pass this law, which they did, everyone else in the country will follow our lead and everyone will try to get this. Like, why are why do they think people want to do like what is going on, Hammond? To push back against a liberal culture that allows divorces to occur, which they say hurts the family. And so they want to prevent divorces because they think two people living in an unhappy marriage is better than two people moving on with their lives after getting a divorce. This they think the very... unhappy marriage is better for the kids. They want that to happen nationwide. This feels very like star-bellied snitches in a way of like, I want this thing to be popular because I want it to be popular and because mm-hmm. I want it, it's good and it's popular. Like, I don't understand what our goal is here. Their goal is to make divorce hard because they think two people staying married forever is always a good thing even if they're unhappy. We... So, okay. so, yeah, they fine. said... If Mike Johnson said this repeatedly, people don't know about this. Once they realize what we have done here, they will start wanting this for themselves as well. But it turns out no one wanted this. No one was pushing for it. The right, even Republicans were not clamoring for this. In fact, in 1997, after Louisiana passed the law to allow this to happen, only two other states passed similar laws, Arizona in 1998, Arkansas in 2001, Mm. And even then... Maybe they're just going in alphabetical order. Yeah. And even then, under 2% of married couples opted for a covenant covenant marriage. Most couples are like, yeah, traditional marriage vows, I'm fine. Because like, it's also in a church and ordained by God. If they want and it to be, yeah. I, I just... This is so... St- I, I am so sorry I keep asking the same question, but it's just really, really confounding to me. Continue. I don't get what's confounding. I, I Because... Okay, when they want to pass um, abortion laws like this, I understand what the goal is, right? They want abortion to stop abortion, and this is they want to stop. I mean, stop divorce, but by doing like an opt into a harder marriage because the people who are like what other ways do they have to make it work? Well, why wouldn't they go? 
after divorce law the way they go after like federal abortion they law. They could, and they would if because they had this, a way to make it work. I, I just think the opt-in nature of this is so, it's going to defeat you before you start. So you're going to make somebody who you already think doesn't take marriage seriously. <laughs> Which gonna, is everybody, apparently. You're going to make them take extra steps to yeah. make it harder to get married and harder to get divorced. They actually and said- no benefits whatsoever. Right. The Republicans get no benefits whatsoever. There was no I benefits for I think they were everything. hoping the pressure campaign would work because let's say your fiancé says, hey, honey, we should get a covenant marriage. And the husband was like, uh, I, I don't really want to do that. Maybe they should think twice before getting married at all. Okay, here's the problem, though. People can secretly get abortions, right? Uh-huh. Like, I can go get an abortion, be back at work on Monday. No one's the wiser. Mm-hmm. If Mikey and I divorce, everybody is aware of it. So you can't even have this, Donald Trump has definitely paid for abortions, but we don't Mm -hmm. have proof of it. We have proof he's been married thrice. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, what I'm confused about is the hypocrites can't, who, hypocrites get divorced, Republicans get divorced, religious people get divorced. You can't hide that. So you can't. Pretend they just that want it to never make it happened. harder for you. They're not trying to pretend it doesn't happen. They acknowledge it happens. They're just trying to raise the bar for what it takes to get divorced so that people who are just unhappy think twice and maybe you bring Jesus into your life as glue. So the thing <sighs> is, the Johnsons kept trying to make fetch a thing here. Uh-huh. Like uh, this is from an AP article about this. Uh, Johnson told the AP he was trying to persuade all of his friends to convert their marriages to covenant marriages. Uh The Johnsons became the poster couple for it. They appeared on Good Morning America like 20 years ago, talking to Diane Sawyer about being among the few such covenant couples in the country. When Sawyer asked Kelly, the wife, about the decision, Kelly, charming and smiling, made the idea seem romantic, as if this was a heightened version of marriage. Now, as you pointed out, like, I don't care if it works for them, I, whatever. Whatever, yeah. Yeah. The problem with this contract, it assumes that everyone else goes into a marriage with, like, a foot already out the door, mm-hmm. which is not how it works. Mm-mm. Most people take their marriage vows, the, the regular kind, mm. they take them seriously. Certainly, at first, they have every intention of staying together. But And the fact that no-fault divorce is an option doesn't bother them because they probably don't think they need it. Right. But of course, some people, a lot of people, eventually do need that out. And I am not here to judge anybody for what reasons they give for why they might want to leave a marriage. 100%. So at that point, though, when they realize, you know what, I'm really unhappy, or I just, I'm in love with someone else, or whatever it is, mm-hmm. at that point, those covenant contracts make it harder for them to get out of bad situations. Because what if they are no longer happy? This contract says, too bad, stay unhappy. That's what you promised. Mm -hmm. The decision you made when you were uh, 20 or like 14 in some homeschooling. Right, like doesn't matter. What if they realize they were not compatible sexually or emotionally, which happens a lot, especially to couples who do a courtship that's really quick or that they get married, like you said, very early because they're just trying to get over the abstinence thing and this is the fastest way to get to that path, to get over that. Like, what if they realize only after they got married, we're not compatible as we thought? Right. Now, a lot of couples would say, well, you should date for a while. You should have sex for a while. Mm-hmm. Let's see if that stuff works. And then you could decide to get married. Obviously, that's not what conservative Christians want you to do. But that means you were choosing marriage and a covenant marriage right. before you actually know the person You are with. What if your beliefs about politics, about religion, about your direction in life, whatever it is, what if they change and you realize this person that I maybe fell in love with at one point, Mm -hmm. I now regret that because I am not the person I was anymore. And what if your allegations, like you mentioned, of physical, of emotional abuse are either not believed by a relevant government officials? What if you were prevented by threat or otherwise from telling anyone about it? Mm. Too damn bad. Because under a covenant contract, divorce isn't permitted for anyone who signed those contracts for those reasons. Mm-hmm. And in fact, this is uh, from a hypothetical that was in a 1997 Washington Post article after the Louisiana law passed. 
Already, for instance, oh, churches in Louisiana were organizing covenant marriage weekends Mm. devoted to couples who wanted to renew their wedding vows by signing this paperwork. This, here's what critics said, that kind of encouragement from pastors, friends, relatives, and of course, fiancés, could constitute a form of emotional blackmail, critics contend, Mm -hmm. in which a reluctant man or woman is pressured into a covenant marriage and later resents it. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, as the children of parents who got divorced will often tell you, they are so much happier after their parents ended an unhappy relationship than they were when the two of them unhappily coexisted. Mm -hmm. Like, remaining in a bad marriage is also a bad idea for anyone who actually wants to leave. Research has shown it can lead to depression, PTSD, possible suicidal ideation. Like, and again, it's not that any of these people getting married are trying to think about how to get on the exit ramp or anything like that. It's that life happens. Situations change. When that happens, everyone is better off knowing there is a way out, even as difficult as that may be. Like, I don't ever want to have to use my fire extinguisher, but I'm also not going to put a padlock on it. That's a wonderful analogy for what we are talking about here. It sounds nice in theory, but it's a horrible idea in practice. Mm -hmm. And I think it's especially dangerous in conservative Christian circles where purity culture norms, like we said, they pressure people to get married young, Mm -hmm. sometimes before they know their partner, Mm -hmm. a lot of times before they know themselves, Mm -hmm. and they play it out in real time on social media, which is hilarious. It's, But if you're in a broken marriage, for whatever the reason is, you should not have to wait for abuse or abandonment in order to move on. And you shouldn't have to air your personal laundry in a courtroom in order to get out of it. Like the option should be available to those who need it, which is what we have right now. But that's the thing with, just as with, with abortion rights, Conservative Christians don't want other people to make choices they may personally disapprove of. So by creating a contract that sounds like a more serious marriage, who knows how many couples were trapped in a union they wish they could escape. Right. And Johnson said his covenant marriage worked because his wife has, and I'm quoting here, stayed with me this whole time. Which the implication there is that she might have left if the marriage contract was a little looser. But that makes it sound like their marriage is based on paperwork, not actual love. Truly. And I'm just kind of scooping into uh, some statistics, but... While you are doing that... Oh, no, I I found it. Like, 47% of uh, Democrats have been divorced and 41% of Republicans... Like, it's not as if all... Like, I guess that's my point of, like, trying... That I'm so baffled by these like this becoming like a GOP thing is like y'all get divorced just as much as anybody else. You like, you just are comfortable burying your past life under the carpet for whatever reason to maintain experiences and your feelings and suppress everything. Uh, Right. Like I don't, I, I see why this didn't gain traction because nobody wants like, no matter how happy your marriage is, if somebody said, I love my husband. If somebody said, Jess, you can never, ever, 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 ever leave your husband no matter what, I would be scared because what the fuck does that mean? Like, why are you trying to try, why are you trying to make it harder for me to get away from you? Right. Like, it, right. to what end? Again, to what end? And it sounds like only to make it harder for women to gain independence, which because I guess Because they Aston believe, answered. which is wrong, they believe that marriage is, no matter how close you are, how in love you are, it doesn't matter. If you, an unhappy marriage is better than a happy single person who got divorced. Have you ever been out to dinner with a couple no. like right? Oh God, no! Up, Other like, people right before they like <laughs> end up splitting up, and you're like, oh, that's what that tension was. <laughs> like it's just so. There's nothing worse than being stuck with a person that you feel like don't want to be around. Yeah. It makes. Yeah. It makes you feel like a crazy person. Like, it truly does. And And here's the thing. So, Mike Johnson has a covenant marriage. Louisiana passed a law allowing for covenant marriage. So did two other states. The fear here, now, let's say Republicans win a governing trifecta next year, which is not out of the question right now. Mm. With Mike Johnson still Speaker of the House, it is possible you could see a national version of this state law. And given all the ways Republicans have tried to control marriage over the years, whether that's opposing interracial marriage, refusing to protect same-sex marriages Mm -hmm. that are already legal, allowing child marriage, Mm -hmm. which is a thing in many states, Mm -hmm. making it harder to get divorced, 
would be right up their alley. Yeah. And the, uh, the irony that the potential president in that situation would be on his third marriage. Right. Totally lost on all of them. Wouldn't matter. Like, it's not that anyone would be forced to sign a covenant marriage contract if such a law passed. It's that the sort of people pressured to sign it may be the sort of people who, like, one day are most in need of a way to break free. I got to tell you, I haven't been this confused by an opinion or a push in in quite some time. I'm really confused by this one. So, uh, so yeah, let's see how that goes. Yep. So I'm a, I enjoy the fact that people are discovering this about Mike Johnson and like, oh, shit. Yeah, he believes a lot of bad stuff, but it's not just a belief. He yeah. is trying to enact these beliefs and push them into law. I was chatting with my coworker. I, you know, walked up while they were talking and I was like, oh, what are you guys talking about? They're like, have you heard about this Mike Johnson guy? Oh, and I was like, yeah. girl, I have. Yeah. Let's commiserate. Yes. <sighs> Um, hey, what's the largest Christian university in the country? You'll get this wrong. Fair warning. Largest Christian university? Largest Christian in the university in the country. Is Loyola? Not even close. Really? Uh, do, no, I don't know. Grand Canyon University, based in Phoenix, you mostly online. You made that up. I just did not. Now. This is a uh, premise for a sitcom. <laughs> it's a community sequel, and it takes place at Grand Canyon University, and they're all rangers and going to school. I'm going to write the script. You should. Uh, the school enrolls over 100,000 students. I think 80% of it is online. Online, yeah. That's but nice. that's still a lot of people. And the reason they're in the news this week is they have just been uh, fined Mm -hmm. for lying to students for years about the actual cost of their grad school programs. Oh, it's wild. Wow. Okay, I was assuming that it was going to be religious related. I was hoping. But it's just bad They're just lying to people. They're just... And this is important. Monsters. They're not the Department of Education, which levied this fine, which I'll tell you about in a second. Mm. They're not going after Grand Canyon University because it's a religious school, even though the school absolutely believes this is Christian persecution. Of course. So here's what happened. The Department of Education just issued a $37.7 million fine mm. against the for-profit GCU. Oh, it's for-profit. It is for Just profit. like Jesus was. Yes. He has 12 profits, though. Nah. nah. <laughs> so what they said... <laughs> it didn't even make sense. The school lowballed their tuition fees in all advertising on the website, whatever, to reel kids in. And once they were in the program, now you're kind of stuck in the program then they would charge them a lot more. I was going to ask if this is legal, but we are learning that it is not because they got fined. Correct. The, the lying is the problem. So here's yeah, yeah. what the uh, Department of Education said. G- this, we're talking specifically about their doctoral programs. GCU lied to more than 7,500 former and current students about the cost of its doctoral programs over several years. Basically, they said on their website, here's the sticker price. If you want to take get a doctorate, get your PhD, mm-hmm. let's say in psychology, uh, just to give you an example. If you go on their website, uh, they will say, oh, you want to get your doctor of philosophy, PhD, in general psychology? The school's website says, well, it's about 60 credit hours that you need to take. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can only transfer like nine credits from another institution, Boy. which means once you're in their program, you really can't get out of it because these tr- uh, credits don't necessarily transfer elsewhere. Is that all post-grad stuff yes. or is that this specific? We're talking specifically about their PhD programs, but in any number of things. But PhD programs, that's yeah. kind of how they work. Okay. But they said you got to take 60 credit hours and the cost is $725 per credit. Okay. And if you do the that's math, that's 43500 Well, money. for all their PhD programs, their sticker price, like I just said, it's between like forty to fifty thousand dollars, depending on which thing you want to get your PhD in, mm-hmm. which is fine. Like other schools have similar programs, have similar costs. Mm-hmm. That part is not weird. There's the nothing. The cost is what it is. The cost is what it is. What the Department of Education found is that ninety-eight percent of students enrolled in those programs paid a higher price than what I just mentioned. The forty to fifty thousand ballpark, that's what it's gonna cost you. Ninety-eight uh-huh. percent of students in those programs had to pay more, which means you are no longer providing an accurate estimate gotcha. of the cost. So, according to the Department of Ed, GCU lied about the cost of its doctoral programs to attract students to enroll. 
today, we are holding GCU accountable for its actions, Mm -hmm. protecting students and taxpayers, and upholding the integrity of the federal student aid programs. Mm -hmm. Why is the Department of Education getting involved in a Christian school's anything? Reason is they were footing loans. They were. They were footing loans. In fact, GCU is. I. I'm looking for the specific thing here. They are. I got the answer too fast. Um. They are the biggest recipient of federal student loans because it's such a huge place. Sure. And the Department of Education wrote in their giant write up here Mm. that internal emails indicate that GCU leadership has been aware since at least January of 2017 that its disclosures about costs, Mm. regarding costs, were incomplete or misleading. Hmm. So, basically what happens is you're in the program, you're you're getting your PhD, you you got to write a dissertation at some point, but after you finish your 60 credit hours, they may say, oh, you have to take continuing education, or you need a few more classes to finish up your degree, Mm. and those will also cost you. And at that point, when you've done this for several years... You're like, well, I got to finish my degree at this point. I've mm. invested too much into it. And that's where these, the additional costs, by the way, per student, come out to between like ten dollars to $12,000 more Jesus. than they expected it would be. So I, I want to just make sure I'm understanding. So say I want to go get my doctorate at Grand Canyon University yep. or whatever, uh, my doctorate in holes. Um, yep. <laughs> I, I get it. Go, I get it. <laughs> I go there. I say, one doctorate, please. I yes. do my, they say, okay, there'll be 60 hours. And I say, great. And I do my 60 hours. And I say, and that, okay, that's I about $45,000 roughly. Okay. And that's what I that's knew what I was getting into. That's what the website said. That's what their advertising okay. material qu- said. Like yes. when I actually take classes and take out loans, I can see how much I'm going to be spending, right? Sure. So the idea is like, they advertise it would be 45000 It's actually going to be like 55000 because of this track I'm going to take. No, you only see that later on on because what you have to take later on is something called a continuation course and you okay. don't find that out until down the road. Okay, so it's so it will be that 45,000 that I expected to pay and then when it comes graduation day and I say one doctorate please right. they're like just one thing. Right, you got to take some more courses to finish wow. up your degree. That's very shady. Very shady. And the school says do we told everybody about the continuation courses because everyone knows at other schools you may have to take those, which is true. But what they say is we mentioned the additional possible fees to students via quote fine print disclosures and other documents. Mm. But the government says no, nah, it's not an okay excuse here. Because if you go to the website, yeah. there's no asterisk sure. next to the number. There's no. It's not clear to students that they would be paying a lot more than what you are advertising on the site. So this is about hmm. you're just you're lying to people about the cost of an education. All we are asking you to do is tell the truth. Mm. Like fifty, our median fifty percent of students pay between X and Y yeah. to get a degree. That's all they have to do, but they don't want to do that, and so. What the Department of Ed said, uh, oh, here's what I was looking for earlier. The reason the government is able to levy this fine at all Mm. is because GCU, despite being a private Christian school, gets over $1.1 billion a year. uh, Is it not a year? But they received over $1.1 billion in Title IV funding, Hmm. which is federal financial aid. Mm -hmm. Students take out loans from the government to take classes there. So the Department of Ed has every right then to make sure those funds are being used as intended. Sure. And the report says, as we speak, more than $18 million in federal loans have been given to 1,344 students enrolled in GCU doctoral programs. 7,547 students have gone through those programs since 2018. Hmm. They have spent over $122 million in tuition. Wow. A lot of that comes from federal loans. So that's why the government's like, we want to make sure they're getting what they, they're taking out loans mm. because they knew what they were getting into. Mm-hmm. That's what the government wants. And actually, they're going easy on GCU because according to the letter, they could have instituted a fine of $509 million, <laughs> which is about $67,500 for each violation. Wow. The actual fine of $38 million, mm. that brings it down to about 5000 mm. a violation. And they reflected on the fact that, you know, this wasn't something you were doing across the whole college. You did it specifically for these doctoral programs. Mm -hmm. Undergrad, we're not seeing that problem. 
other programs gotcha. that don't require a dissertation, we're not seeing the problem. Is that fine big enough to off- offset any the income that they made by scamming these students? No, it's lower. I, if it's $5,000 a violation, no, it doesn't offset the cost. Mm. But $38 million is still a lot of money, can, and the school does not want to pay it. Can you help me understand why it's a punishment to... Like, I stole $100 from you, and my fine is I have to you. pay $60. Yeah. Can you help me understand why that is anything? Probably because by giving you that $60 fine, and I'm also publicizing it, and the shame and the public scandal of it all might deter some students uh, from enrolling in that school. The year of our Lord 2023 shame mm, is no longer a factor that is in true. how anybody does anything. So in response to the fine that the Department of Ed issued this week, mm-hmm. the school now has, I think, 20 days to respond. Um, and by the way, to be clear, it's not like the Department of Ed just magically sprung this on them. They've been pointing this stuff out for a long time. Oh, sure. Uh, the school did not fix the problem, and to anyone's satisfaction, that's why they levied the fine now. But the school now says it did nothing wrong. Oh. It says the allegations are a series of, quote, lies and deceptive statements. And here's what they said. God, the GC- state of discourse in this country is uh-huh. horrible. Here's what they actually said. GCU categorically denies every accusation in the Department of Education statement. This is further evidence of the coordinated and unjust actions the federal government is taking against the largest Christian university in the country. It's like, buddy, they don't care about your religion. I'm so tired. Nowhere in the 30-some pages that the department sent the school did they bring up anything about Christianity. Also... Because it's not yeah, about that. It's it about isn't. the lie. And I, yeah, this is this is a wild accusation. Now, but at this point, there's no logic, right? They can appeal the fine through a formal hearing or in writing and say, you missed something, here's the deal, whatever. We'll see how that plays out. But if the punishment stands and the school refuses to pay it, then the federal government could say, we're not giving loans to people going to a shady school, mm-hmm. and they could just cut off that pipeline for students, which would be... It would destroy the school. The school mm. relies on that money. So this is going to have to be resolved one way or the other. I mean, this this feels very much akin to the schools that have, you know, uh, God bless America on their walls or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then there's a lawsuit and they're like, oh, my God, they're making us pay a million dollars in law fines. It's like, well, nobody's making you do that. You... Let it get to this point by right. not jumping on it when all you had to do was take a sign down or all you had to do was stop being predatory, but you yeah. ignore the problem. If the school just said, This is what our average student pays to get their PhD, and that was the actual number, however they wanted to define it, there are ways to be shady with statistics and yeah. still tell the truth. But if 98% of your doctoral students are paying a higher than listed price for their degree, then the estimated price is clearly understating it, and it's a lie. And you have to assume, like, these are smart people, so it's not like like a payday lending thing where they're pr- preying on people with, like, less information and less understanding of how that works. It's your PhD students that you're trying to pull one over. So, yeah. like, you're trying to scam the people you're educating, dude. Like, and scam the best representatives right? of your school because they're trying to earn a doctorate from your school. These are the people you want out in the world. Just be open about the fact, look, it'll cost you 60000 right. not forty five. And it costs what it costs. Like, that's another yeah. conversation to be had. I just, like, this is why, like, the unfettered capitalism is so destructive because it is taking down institutions that should not be focused on gain on earning money. These I mean obviously this is a for profit, but right. like educational institutions, healthcare institutions should not be in the business of trying to make money. They should be in the business of doing the thing they're supposed to do. Yeah, that's uh, do the post office thing. I yeah. don't care if you make money. Your job is to deliver the mail yeah. and if it comes at a loss so be it. It's not a business. Stop yeah. treating it like one. It's not a business and we're not trying to like get get away with as little as we can. Like, we should be spending this... At, this is like the IRS, too. Like, I like that the IRS is getting funded or getting better funded because yeah. that means they can go after people who are cheating the system. Mm-hmm. And I want a Department of Education like this one that goes after predatory schools mm-hmm. because I don't trust that that would happen 
certainly not to a Christian school no. in a Republican-run administration. No, so kudos to the Department of Education for going after this. Yeah, that's great And news. not letting the Christian side of GCU, like, prevent them from doing Color it. Color me shocked that the largest Christian university in the country is a, called Grand Canyon University, B, I've never heard of it, and C, a for-profit company. Uh-huh. And by the way, Liberty University, which also has a robust online thing, they're also, for reasons we talked about earlier, they're also in trouble with the government because mm-hmm. they're not following Title IX requirements mm-hmm. and protecting students on campus. Yep. So they're under investigation as well. A couple of years ago, there was a little uh, beef between those two schools because Liberty, under Jerry Falwell Jr., said, we're the largest Christian university in the country. And they use this in all their marketing stuff. Oh, boy. And I believe uh, Jack Jenkins, the reporter at Religion News Service, is like, actually, you're not the largest because if it's by students, yeah. uh, Grand Canyon actually has more than you. And they were, they, Liberty did not enjoy being known as the second largest. Well, yeah, it sucks oh, well. when numbers are what they are. Like, truly, Listen, these the people, people who teach the world is 6,000 years old are not really good with numbers. It's true. Like, they just want the world to bend around their worldview. They don't want to do anything to, like, become better or earn more money or be smart. They just want everybody to, like, hey, just give me more money. Hey, just tell me I'm, I'm the biggest. Tell me I'm the biggest boy in the world. I'm the yeah. biggest Christian school in the whole wide world. Tell me again, Dad. Like... It's so sad. I'm pretty sure pissing off PhD students, the people who are likely to earn more money Mm. than regular uh, graduates of the school, pissing them off by lying to them about tuition is probably not the best marketing strategy either. Sorry, being a Christian university and being like, you should hold yourself to a higher standard. If y'all think Christianity is the fucking end all be all, then we should be holding these places to a much higher standard instead of like a covenant marriage contract. Oh boy. Is what they need at these colleges. I hate this place. Yes. Let's talk about the Southern Baptists. Oh, I hate that place too. Yes, you do. You're going to hate them even more after this. Mm. Uh, so they've been in the news for the past several years because just like the Catholic Church, they have a massive problem with childhood sexual abuse. Mm-hmm. And what they just did this past week, it's actually an old story, but everyone just found out about it like this week. Oh, and how they, old? Like several, several months old. Hmm. And basically they found a new way to fight against survivors of sexual abuse. And everyone only picked up on this recently, and even the leadership is like, oh, no, what have we... We didn't realize we were hurting victims again. So let's (laughs) talk about what happened here. I'm going to tell you a story. This is a disturbing story, but it is true, and it's important to make sense of what happened here. There's a woman named Samantha Killary. She was adopted at the age of two, by a police officer in Louisville, Kentucky. His name was Sean Jackman. So Sean, the cop, he adopts this girl at the age of two. And she lived with him until she was 18. And according to her, she was sexually assaulted Mm. by the cop uh, who adopted her. Mm. It was only years later, like when she secretly recorded him, she caught him admitting to what he did. And only then was this guy charged with crimes. And in 2018 this cop was sentenced to 15 years behind bars, which is where he is today. Good. Okay. But what she said, Samantha, she didn't just want him to be punished. She said there were others who knew what was going on, including one of his ex-girlfriends. She knew what he was doing to Mm -hmm. her and said nothing. She was also in the police department. So was this guy's father. So she wanted to go after them as well for keeping silent about this. Good. And she sued the police department that employed all of them. Good. Uh, So here's the thing. A judge eventually tossed out those other cases, uh, not the one against her adoptive father, because she caught him. in the. She had the recording, and he's in jail. But all the other lawsuits were tossed out. And the reason the judge tossed them out is he said the statute of limitations to bring these cases has long expired. Mm, thank because, God we honor that statute mm-hmm. of limitations. Basically, the assaults against uh, Samantha, they ended in 2009, and the law in Kentucky said you only have five years to bring forth sexual abuse claims. Mm-hmm. And she had passed that, so that's why the judge tossed him out. Now, over the past several years, as we have talked about uh, on this show in the past, several states have passed laws, especially in response to the Catholic Church scandals, They've passed laws giving victims, survivors of sexual abuse, more time to file such lawsuits. They've expanded the statute of limitations. Sometimes they've created a window where, like, hey, for the next two, three years, 
No if, It doesn't matter when it happened. You can file your lawsuits right now mm-hmm. uh, to try to make up for all that lost time. So in Kentucky, they have done the same thing. Victims in Kentucky, survivors, I should say, in Kentucky, now have 10 years oh, to file such claims, not just five. It's still and as not of, a lot. It's not a it's lot, but better. Better. In 2021, they passed a law saying organizations that harbor abusers are also subject to those lawsuits. Bing bong. So look at that. So here's the question. Can her lawsuit against the police department and those other people, does it get a second life? Can she try again? More broadly speaking, if the alleged abuse occurred before these laws were passed, Mm -hmm. can victims who had previously been shut out file a lawsuit now to go after you know, their abusers and the people who harbored them. Normally in the legal system, if a judge dismisses a lawsuit, is that it for that lawsuit in general? This is the question. Okay. It seems like it would be that you can't try, you can't just keep filing the same lawsuit again. Sure. But this law has changed and now maybe she can go after them again. Huh. So this case is now in front of the Kentucky Supreme Court. Hmm. Like, can you refile your case because you were shut out in the past and now the law allows you to do it? The judge tossed it out before. Can you refile that case? Can these people bring forth that lawsuit? What's the argument against being able to do that? The argument against it is it's already been... uh, On one side, you have victims' rights groups saying you need to give survivors more time to sue. It's important for the sake of justice. Many victims don't realize they were victims of abuse until long after. And even those who are aware of what happened may be hesitant to go after their assailants in court. Mm -hmm. So allowing older cases of abuse to be tried is vital to fix the mistakes of the past. Mm -hmm. Now, the argument against that is a general argument against uh, not expanding statute of limitations. If something happened decades and decades ago, and you are now saying, this person harbored the abuser, this uh, person abused me, but it happened decades and decades ago, Mm -hmm. it's a lot harder for your alleged assailant to provide a defense of... Of their own actions. Like, I I don't know what I did 30 years ago. Or if there was a a witness who could have attested to the fact that this never happened, Mm. maybe that person has died. It's a lot harder to form a defense. Gotcha. Now, the argument against that is they the uh, to suck. the survivor would still have to overcome some burden of proof. Mm-hmm. It's not like it's just a he said she said exactly. thing. So this is the argument for who cares when it happened. Allow them to try to get justice. Mm-hmm. And look, if the bar if they haven't reached that bar, okay, it's not going to happen. But you got to give them a chance. So again, the Kentucky Supreme Court this week heard that case, and we'll see what they decide to do. It's an entirely Republican bench. Oh boy. Yeah. So we're not I'm this it's one thing to say what are they going to do with this particular case involving Samantha? Mm. But more broadly speaking, like how are they going to handle these issues of sexual abuse and things like that? Mm. So, this is where it gets interesting because while this case is going through, you might have as with the Supreme Court, the US Supreme Court, you might have other groups that say, "You know what? We have nothing to do with this case, but the outcome could affect us, so we have a take on it, and we're going to present our legal arguments for why the Supreme Court should rule one way or the other. And what's that called? It's called an amicus brief. And they're saying, we want to file an amicus brief saying, we have nothing to do with this, but you should listen to our arguments. Mm -hmm. To inform the decision you're about to make? To inform the decision, because maybe you should consider this. And what's amazing, you would think Southern Baptists at this point, who have gone through a public reckoning regarding right. their sexual abuse problems, would want to avoid anything like this. But what a reporter discovered this week when this case was being heard in front of the Kentucky Supreme Court is that in April, the Southern Baptist Convention, and not just Southern Baptist Convention, the Southern Baptist Convention, the executive committee oh. of the Southern Baptist Convention, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, and Lifeway Christian Resources, which is like their marketing, publishing, everything outlet of the SBC, they filed a joint amicus brief saying, you should totally side against the victims here and do not allow any victims to bring forth a case when uh, the statute of limitations, if they were locked out before, you got to keep them locked out. That's a good look, you guys. That is what the the SBC lawyers filed, and people only found out they filed this this week. And people are surprised? Well, they are surprised in part because over the past year, at least on paper and through their elected leadership, 
the Southern Baptists said, look, we absolutely screwed up in the past. We are trying to make things right. We are taking actions to make sure this sort of stuff is prevented, that it's not a revolving door where someone uh, commits an act of abuse, gets fired from a church, and then just moves over to the church estate away. Mm -hmm. They have taken some steps, or at least that's what they said they were going to do. Here's what the Courier-Journal reported this week. In their brief, the SBC's brief, they say, of, of course, we do not dispute the laudable policy reasons for providing relief for victims of childhood sexual abuse. But yep. not even the most sacrosanct policy can trump the due process concerns pre presented in this and similar cases involving the attempted retroactive application of expired claims. Expired claims. Yeah, basically claims. saying, look, if it happened a while ago, the alleged uh, abusers will not really get due process under the law, and that's unfair for that. And so we're trying to protect the law here and the rights of anyone accused of a crime because the law cares about that. So the brief basically says, though, by the way, the SBC is a fellowship of 47,000 churches. They are on the hook for claims dating back to 2003 that mm. they knew about abuse and violated their duties in responding to it. Mm -hmm. So they're saying like, look, if you allow retroactive cases to come forth, right. uh, we're fucked. So they, they really don't want the law. They must have said it in a. They like, did not say the word "fucked" in the brief. No, no. <laughs> How are they? Well, I guess they're just framing it as like the rights of the accused is more yes. important than anything else. Yes, that is exactly how they are putting it. How can you like say with one breath we need to be better about taking care of victims and then immediately be like, but not those. Right? So also, the SBC has a sexual abuse task force, like a select appointed group of people whose job it is to tell the SBC how to do better. They just found out about this brief this week. And so they issued a statement basically saying, what the fuck is going on here? Here's what they said in a really interesting uh, statement they put out. This brief and the policy arguments made in it were made without our knowledge and without our approval. Moreover, they do not represent our values and positions. Mm, represent it, some of your values yeah. and positions? It has long been recognized, they said, that access to the justice system is a fundamental part of identifying and stopping abusers, as well as creating lasting, effective reform to protect the next generation. By taking this stand against access to the justice system, the leaders, wait for this, the leaders who approved this position have joined with the Catholic Church, powerful insurance companies, Michigan State University, Whoa! with Larry Nasser, and many others who have sought to close the halls of our courts to survivors of abuse, and it was a choice to stand against every survivor in Kentucky. Oh, my. So that's the SBC's own sexual abuse task force saying, what the hell? This goes against everything we are trying to fix. I just have to sort of recalibrate my entire worldview after hearing that. I that's know. an impressively Very good impressive. condemnation. And you know it's bad when they're like, SBC, you're acting like the Catholics. What are you doing? We're supposed to do better now. The fact that they not only name check the Catholics, but University of Michigan. With that's the gymnast, the devastating. Coach. Yeah. Shit, man, they yeah. are not here to play. Yeah. Wow. They, now, they noted that opening up older cases may create, quote, valid factual questions about what happened, but opposing this case, taking this position, quote, is a deliberate effort to ensure those questions are never asked. There was also another statement put out by three women who have been, who are Baptists or were Baptists anyway. And they've been very courageous and outspoken about the need to reform the SBC. Mm. Uh, Megan Lively, Jules Woodson, and Tiffany Thigpen, they said they were sickened and saddened to be burned yet again mm. by the actions of the SBC against survivors. Here's what they said. The SBC proactively chose to side against a survivor and with an abuser and the institution that enabled his abuse. Hmm. These are the same arguments made repeatedly by organizations rife with the cover-up of sexual abuse, including the Catholic Church. Dang. Everyone's ripping Catholic on the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is getting man. dragged. Yeah. So they were asking. They want... This is what they said in their letter. Yeah. We want SBC member bodies, like the churches, mm. to denounce the activities 
enormous costs and pain of the double-edged sword being shown against survivors and reform in the SBC. They also wanted to know, hey, SBC, how much money did you spend on this brief? Because there are eight lawyers who signed their name to wow. it. And all those people needed to be paid for their time. Sure. And how much did you spend on this brief and fighting this case versus how much money you've claimed to invest in supporting reform efforts? Because uh-huh. that would be interesting. Dang. Yeah. They fucked around and they found out. Uh-huh. <laughs> and again, this was filed, this amicus brief, filed back in April, only finding out about it now the week the Supreme Court is hearing this case. And, like, there's no way to move God, forward. I completely forgot where right? we started. Okay. There's no way to move forward with abuse reform when the SBC is clearly dead set on making sure victims of abuse are not able to seek justice. So here's the ultimate question. Who the hell okayed any of this? Because the SBC seemed to be caught off guard, too. Like, uh, the, the Southern Baptist Convention's elected leaders are like, uh, I don't remember signing an wow. okay on this. And mind you, Remember, it wasn't like one dude who signed off on this. Six? It was the Southern Baptist Convention, their executive committee, the theological seminary and all that. Like, who said this was a good idea? What was the process for them saying, should we get involved in this case that has nothing I, to do with us? And there, someone had to say yes. Yeah, I, I really think this is another, kind of like we talked about before, another example of like, I'm just going to do whatever the fuck I want and there will be no consequences for mm-hmm. me. Like, it just feels like everything we talk about of like, well, if I keep pretending it's not happening, maybe they'll just leave me alone. Yeah. Like a toddler or an ostrich. So on Friday, when all this hit the fan last week, mm. the executive committee's officers for the Southern Baptist Convention, they confirmed no trustees approved the amicus brief. None of them had anything to do with it. Instead, they said, we joined the brief on the advice of our attorneys. The statement does not address who approved joining the brief. But at the time, this is funny, this is from Religion News Service. At the time the brief was filed, like in April, the executive committee was led by former interim president Willie McLaurin, who resigned in August after admitting he had faked his resume. Uh Uh-huh. I do have an update to this, though. What do you mean? I just learned about it. How can I there know. be an update? The update is we actually now know who okayed oh, all of this. Oh, boy. This is like flipping in the back of an Agatha Christie novel. Uh, by the way, before I get into that, yeah. uh, the full statement from the SBC's executive committee wasn't much better. It said, we don't take a position on the underlying litigation. Oh, we are so not. Brave. This is not a lobbying effort to restrict statutes of limitation. Rather, it urges the court to apply the current Kentucky statute as it was drafted and intended. Which is saying, just follow the law and don't let anyone bring up a case. Uh, Southern Seminary President Al Mohler, who was a big shot in the SBC, he said, uh, I can't answer your questions like ask my lawyers, but he did say, uh, in questions of law, significant constitutional and legal questions arise and require arguments to be made before courts. Which is a way of saying, uh, I opened up a legal textbook to page one to explain how courts work to all you dumbasses who don't know how it works. So stop yelling at us for getting involved in a legal case where a serious constitutional question has come up. So, like, they were not doing good with the PR statements. No, they're not doing really much of any good anywhere for anybody. So here's what's interesting. All right. The former president of the Southern Baptist Convention is a guy named Bart Barber. And we've talked about him because he actually appeared on 60 Minutes last year when the Southern Baptist Convention was getting hammered for its lack of doing anything on sexual abuse. And basically, was it Anderson Cooper? He's interviewing Bart Barber, who doesn't do a lot of interviews, certainly not with mainstream media, mm. saying like, so why? what's what's going on with your religion? What's happening? What's happening? <laughs> Did what you is? Kill yourself? I know. <laughs> like, what is happening here? And Explain Bart yourself. Barber Explain yourself. Was basically saying he put on like his happy face, his genial face, mm. and tried to explain, like, yeah, we have made mistakes. We are trying to correct them. I, I thought he partly came off looking pretty good, mm. but at the same time, the, he like whiffed on the simplest questions, like, well, if a fourteen-year-old victim of sexual abuse needs an abortion surely she should be exempted, right? Like, she should be allowed to get it. He's like, no. And gay people should be allowed to have rights and, uh, like, merit? No. So, like, was it a great interview? Uh, Not exactly, but Bart Barber 
put out a blog post that he's not the president anymore. He served two terms. Mm-hmm. He is. It, they are one year terms. Wait, he's not the one who didn't faked his resume, right? No, no, no. Okay, he's not the guy, guy who faked his resume. But he served one term. They reelected him for another year, and now it's another guy. Bart Barber said uh, he was looking through his emails, and he realized he was the guy who okayed going forward with this case. He wrote, "Quote: This is my doing. I approved it." I take full responsibility for the SBCs having joined this brief. Now, he also says, which this doesn't make anyone feel better about it, he basically says, I did it in haste. I didn't realize, like, what we were actually doing. The lawyer said it was a good idea. I didn't thoroughly investigate it. Yeah, because the stakes aren't very high or anything. There's yeah. no need for you to be thoughtful about the actions that you take. Here's what Bart Barber wrote. You, you take this as you will. In the middle of the day, I now know that I received an email from the SBC's legal team making me aware of this brief and recommending that we join it. It came at 1.30 p.m., which was during the executive committee trustee orientation and a little more than two hours before I needed to lead that other meeting. The filing deadline was that day, the email said, so I had a little more than three hours to reply one way or the other. So he's like, I had a lot of shit going on. And I'm not a lawyer. Then it sounds like your lawyers are fucking terrible if uh-huh. they put something in front of you that you need to read and sign and they don't give you adequate time to do that. Mm-hmm. What mm-hmm. the fuck Here's what is he wrong also with wrote. people? I do not recall my exact thoughts in reading the brief. I, do not, I did not know the circumstances of the underlying legal case involving Samantha. I do, however... No, what has been my consistent practice in addressing these legal matters. So I'm very confident that I was reading that brief, asking myself the question, is this an honest, true legal question for which the Southern Baptist Convention can take this position in good faith? What was I thinking? I was thinking about that question. I did what I did because of the answer to that question. He thought the SBC needed to inject itself into this matter and then he's like, I don't know what I think about statutes of limitations. Okay, so he did it. How come he didn't come forward before? I don't think he thought this was a big deal until this a couple, like a week ago, when people found out they filed this brief, and everyone's like, "Wait, did the Southern Baptist Convention just take the side of abusers in a case involving justice for victims of sexual abuse?" And Bart Barber is saying, "I didn't realize that's what this case was about." I thought it was about some larger issue, yada, yada, yada. He's trying to make an excuse. It's, it, it, it's, it's also embarrassing because... These... And he's the good face of the organization. Like, he was supposed to be the good face of the organization. I don't know, man. Like, at what point do you just take the L and walk away? Like... Well, it's too late when now because about, the case was heard. When we talk about the confidence of mediocre white men, this is the kind of thing I think we should pay more attention to because this dude who is some idiot is so bad at his job or this company is so poorly run and two things can be true that something really important ended up on his desk that he either... Signed without reading or understanding fully, or did read and fully understand, but did not communicate that with anybody else in the in the organization. I believe him that he says, like, I just didn't know what I was really signing. And my lawyer said, Yeah, we should do this. And he's like, Yeah, okay. It then you're fine. bad at your job and you yes. should be fired. Like I w- when we yeah. see like when fucking Elon Musk does another dumb thing, people are like, Oh, it's just this or the other. Okay, well, this or the other means he's bad at his fucking job and he should not have it anymore. Mm-hmm. You don't just get to keep a job because you want it real bad. And and again, it's not that he lost his job. It's that his terms ran out. So he's not the leader anymore. No, no, no I understand. I'm right? just saying wh- so many times when these things happen and something horrible happens and it's just some like some middle management dude like, oh, I just didn't realize this was a big yeah, deal. Yeah, no one wants to take responsibility. It's so He's saying embar- it was me, but also don't be mad at me because oh I wasn't God, thinking so about that. It's embarrassing for them. They just like are, ugh, yep. ugh. That's the that's the reformed Southern Baptists side of things. Whatever. All right, I have a little good news to report about an older story. Mm-hmm. So, eighteen months ago, there was a public school district in West Virginia. Uh, they forced students to attend an in-school religious revival. 
Yeah. That case just ended. Sure. Here's what happened. You said West Virginia? West Virginia. Mm-hmm. February of 2022 at a Huntington High School, uh, there was an assembly, and it featured Nick Walker Ministries. Who is Nick Walker? He's a Christian who has long made clear that his desire is to proselytize in public schools. He's bragged on Facebook about giving talks at high schools with an intent to convert kids. Mm -hmm. And he thinks if students invite him to their school, he has a license to preach, which is not always how that works. Mm -mm. And after he went to Huntington High School, he even bragged, I got the screenshot, it says 50 students gave their lives to Jesus at their voluntary club meeting. Like a little (laughs) caveat there. But the thing is, was it a voluntary club meeting? Because I wouldn't care if that's the case. Mm. But he did not visit. mandatory. He did not visit an after-school Bible club because here's what we know. He was the focus of an assembly that took place during the school day. Mm. Students later told the local news it wasn't voluntary either. Some people said they had to attend the assembly. Parents were not even required to sign a permission slip for it. The school even agreed because in a statement, they referred to that whole assembly as a mistake Oops. in the media. Uh, the, this is the director of communications at Cabell County Schools at the time, mm-hmm. a year and a half ago. Of course, as soon as we heard about the situation, we did make the changes that we had to make. Unfortunately, the teachers made a mistake in this case in taking the students and taking them to that as part of a requirement. It was a mistake. It was something we addressed immediately, and we hope this will never happen again. So look, if it was a mistake, that might be acceptable. If that was an honest reflection, and it was a mistake, and they they are taking steps to make sure it never happens again. Right. The problem is there were a lot of reasons to think that statement and the district were just trying to cover their asses after the fact. Um, And part of that is because you know this would never happen with like an Islamic or satanic or atheist assembly. So... There was audio from the assembly that made it clear this was a religious revival that not a single adult in the crowd tried to put a stop to it. Uh. There was evidence that Walker was invited to the school without even having to provide a cover story. Like, it's not like he was supposed to talk about kids, don't do drugs, and then he shoved Jesus into it. No, this was all about pushing faith on the kids. Mm -hmm. There was no secular reason this should have happened in a public school during regular hours. What about the teachers who said attendance was required? One of them, a student said, deliberately referred to Nick Walker as a guest speaker with no mention of his religious affiliations. Another teacher said certain students, like Jewish ones, needed it. Needed to go to this assembly. They were also told that leaving the assembly... I feel like you inserting, like, the Jewish ones, I feel like they think, like, y'all need Jesus in a way of, like, you guys are acting like dicks and you need Jesus. I doubt she literally meant... I'll see if I can find the actual line there. But students were also told that if they tried to leave that assembly, they could be suspended for it. Well, that's troubling. The worst mistake, in big quotes, is when the district rationalized their error by saying this assembly was student-led and it occurred during non-instructional time. So we weren't pulling kids out of classes to see this thing. But the thing is, one, wasn't student-led. And the period in question, the non-instructional time, it's kind of like a homeroom period in the district where students are supposed to meet with their teachers for extra help, go study somewhere. Like, just because you're not in class doesn't mean it's not instructional. If they have to do it every day, then obviously the school sees some value there. Right, right. And in fact, there was a student uh, named Max at the time. He staged a walkout during, like this is days later after students complained about this. He staged a walkout among his peers saying, let's walk out during non-instructional time. Wow, good for him. Because, hey, apparently the school doesn't think that time is important. Mm. He said if a revivalist Christian sermon can be held for students during that time, we claim the absolute ability to protest the violation of our rights that accompanied this sermon during the same apparently pointless period. Mm. Um, he was joined by over 100 students, by the way. Wow. Not bad. Not bad. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, Freedom From Religion Foundation got involved. They wanted all the information about this. Um, and it turns out mm. what they discovered is this is so not a one-off mistake made by the district. In 2019, they had written to the superintendent regarding religious clubs that were created by adults. The school <laughs> never responded. In 2017, they wrote to the previous superintendent about other religious assemblies during the school day Mm. because those were happening then, too. They can't stop. And for the assembly with Nick Walker, FFRF found that the principal approved it, attended it, 
knew it was not student-led, and did nothing to stop the event, even when it became clear what was happening. Yeah, that sounds suspiciously like the truth. uh Uh-huh. So they eventually filed a federal lawsuit against the district on behalf of Max. Yep. Against Max, because they were violating the U.S. Constitution. Oh, duh. On behalf of Max and the parents of several other students. Mm. Um, And they filed the lawsuit. They asked for $1 per plaintiff in damages, because this isn't about the money. And bottom line is, after years of, well, after more than a year of this case, Mm. this week, the school district agreed, we'll settle this case and just get it out of court. And what they agreed to is the following. One is they're going to pay the legal bills for FFRF, which amounts to over $175,000. Yep. That's That's what we were talking about earlier. That's the big headline. It'll come out of their insurance, uh, so it's not like they're taking money away from kids. But their insurance premiums will probably go up. Maybe their insurance premiums go up. Also, they they said, we've made policy changes that say annual in-service training will be required for all employees regarding church-state separation laws. Wow. Um, They're going to make sure principals will attempt in good faith to monitor graduations, assemblies, athletic events, and other school-sponsored activities to make sure religion is not seeping through. They will require those principals to report any potential violations within seven days. Mm. And students are forbid. I'm sorry, teachers, employees are forbidden from initiating religious worship with students. So... Aren't those all the real regular laws anyway? I mean, they should be. Some of those laws were put in place before FFRF sued, Mm. but the district now has to follow those rules, right? The training is new. Everything else just has to be followed. Um, FFRF, by the way, gave $2,000 scholarships to the six students who participated in the case. Nice. Good for them. Um, And Max was awarded an activist award last year. And again, all of this could have been avoided Mm -hmm. if the district just followed the law to begin with Instead, they were like, we can shove Jesus in kids' faces. No one will ever know. It's West Virginia. Hmm. It's only now that they're facing consequences. I did reach out to Nick Walker, like, hey, buddy, what do you you think about (laughs) this lawsuit in your name that you're a big part of? He did not respond to me. Why? I don't know. It's very sad. Dang. Also, wait, I I written something down that I wanted to quickly jump back to when we're talking about the statute of limitations. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think another important thing to bear in mind is that our brains are not done fully cooking until we're like 26. Uh So if somebody was abused as a 12 year old, even giving them until they're 22, you still don't have the emotion necessarily have the emotional capacity to deal with that. That's why those statute of limitations uh, issues have always involved like childhood sexual abuse cases. Mm -hmm. Cause what happened to you as a child, you may not come to terms with for Mm. decades Mm -hmm. after the fact. And if the law says, "Eh, too bad, it's too late for you, it's like, at that point, what can you do to get justice, especially if the alleged assailant is still working in the church? Uh, Right, and the people who who are supposed to protect you are the ones putting you in danger. It's all all a mess, anyway. Uh, I got one last story for you here because this is one to keep an eye on. The Texas Supreme Court, also full of Republicans, is now considering whether a judge could be sanctioned for pulling a Kim Davis that works for a government job. Her job is to perform a function. Mm -hmm. And she says, yeah, but I don't like gay people. Like, could she be sanctioned by the body that oversees her for saying my religion says I don't have to follow the law, even though my job is to follow the law? Sorry that I'm an actual idiot. But like, can you tell me what a sanction is as if I'm a child? Yeah. Here's what happened. December of the fine. Sure. December of 2019, Texas Justice of the Peace, Diane Hensley, Mm. she's allowed to perform court marriages, court weddings, right? Right. Like a couple says, we don't want to do a big elaborate thing. We just want to come to the courthouse, get approved, whatever. She's allowed to do that, and she could do it like for a side cost. It's a side gig for some of these judges. Sure. Like I'll perform weddings for like a hundred bucks a pop. Yeah. Fine. So she was doing that. But she said, I'm not going to do it for gay couples. Whoops. In 2019, she was given a public warning by the Texas Commission on Judicial Conduct. Doesn't mean they were removing her from the job. They just said, you're like casting... a slap on the wrist kind of deal? It really was. Like a public, hey, acknowledgement of you did a bad thing? They said she was casting doubt on her capacity to act impartially, mm. and she could be punished in the future. They were not removing her from the job, but like, hey, we might have to do something about it. We're not sure what yet. Mm -hmm. Like I said, keep an eye on this situation as it develops. 
But so that's what they mean by sanction. Like we might slap you on the wrist or say, hey, you're not allowed to do this sort of thing. And but, but they were not saying we're going to fire escalates to fines or disbarred. It could. It could. Okay. But nothing had been decided about that. I guess what I'm trying to establish is like this is all internal, yes. like internal, like judge. Shit. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So how did she respond to that threat of like, hey, if you are being a bigot here, we may have to do something about it. Oh, her Sh- response was, you're right. I see the error of my ways. We're <laughs> all God's children. Right. No, she sued them. She <gasps> sued oh! the commission on judicial conduct because how dare they point out her Christian bigotry Ooh. in her lawsuit. They said the commission violated the Texas Religious Freedom Restoration Act by investigating and punishing Judge Hensley for recusing herself from officiating at same-sex weddings. They did not punish her. Um, But basically, they said the state of Texas has substantially burdened the free exercise of her religion Mm. with no compelling justification. Which is weird, because there was compelling justification. The justification is people deserve to be treated equally under the law, Mm -hmm. and a gay couple that wants to get married should have the same ability to do it as a straight couple. That's it. And if a judge says, I perform wedding ceremonies... And if you say I'm only doing it for straight couples and not gay ones, then you shouldn't be offering the service. Mm -hmm. That's it. Being Christian doesn't allow you as a government official Mm -hmm. to ignore the law. It wasn't okay with Kim Davis. She has now had to pay the price for it, literally, and it shouldn't be okay with Hensley. She wanted $10,000 in damages, Hensley did, because she's like, that's the money you took from me because I can't do weddings anymore, basically. Uh, She also wanted a declaration that everyone in her position could pull the same stunt if their God commanded it. Mm -hmm. Now, in 2021, a judge tossed out her case on technicalities, basically saying the commission, the ethics commission, like they have sovereign immunity from law. You can't go after them because you don't like what they say. Yeah. Um, It's like suing ethics itself. Like, you just can't do that. And an appeals court said, yeah, this is stupid. We're tossing, we're affirming that ruling. This case is bullshit. Okay. But Diane Hensley wanted the state Supreme Court to hear this case, and that is what they decided to do last week. I think my understanding of how American law works is Is absolutely right. Is getting more accurate and darker. (laughs) Yes. Her lawyer, guess who her lawyer is? His name is Jonathan Mitchell. Who is, what's he famous for? Oh God, probably defending a fetus. Close. Very close. He's the former state solicitor general who is behind the state's abortion bounty law. Oh, I was really close actually. So she got the guy who's like, oh, if you know someone who knew someone who was getting an abortion, you can tattle on them and we'll give you money for it. Yeah, just like Jesus did. Uh, Wait, because Jesus is really happy when Judas uh, turned him in for 30 pieces of silver, gold, or whatever, right? Like everybody in the Bible is like, great job, Judas. Yeah. Yep. And the thing is, like, she could have avoided (laughs) this. Let's take your example and apply it to the rest of the world. Yes. She could have avoided this whole situation if she just said, I don't want to perform same sex marriages for religious reasons. All she had to do is say, fine, then I won't perform marriages as part of my side hustle. But no, she wants her cake and eat it too. She's like, no one's forcing her to perform weddings against her will. She chose to do that. Yeah. But she wants the ability to sign marriage certificates for straight couples and not gay ones. And she thinks her religion takes priority over the law, even though she's working for the government. Yeah. If we allow government officials to pick and choose which rules to follow, everything turns into chaos mm-hmm. and it would make a mockery out of civil rights. Well, like, as the. That's commi- the- point yeah i mean the commission's lawyer even explained no one's punishing or threatening to punish her for her religious views Mm -hmm. it's all about her actions if a christian judge made it clear he doesn't want to perform any marriages because he's a bigot that'd be fine no one would be upset about it like Mm -hmm. legally speaking but she is doing something that's illegal what's interesting is she can she did an interview with the dallas morning news last month Mm -hmm. diane hensley did and she said i haven't performed marriages in years Partly because, like, she's been very depressed about this whole situation. Mm. A huge loss, I'm sure, for she everyone. She should pray about it. She should. She also claimed falsely that children living with opposite-sex parents fare better in life. That's not true. Mm-mm. There was also this anecdote. I did not realize this until now. She has a now-deceased gay brother. Mm. And she said, after he had a falling out with their parents over what she described as, quote, economics. I don't know what that means. Hensley said she hired a detective to track him down once a year and take a photograph as a gift for their mother. One year he was in Paris, another year in Japan, 
then Dubai. She stalked her gay brother after he had a falling out with her parents. And he was like living his best life. Yes. And she was hired a private detective. Like, can you take pictures of him? Well, this explains why she's a di- she's interested in the bounty guy. Like, <laughs> she clearly has like a spy bent to Dude, her. No what kidding. What a lunatic! Interesting. Her bounty lawyer. Also, can you imagine being her poor brother? And it's like my fucking conservative sister who will not leave the state of Texas. Just once in a while, it's like. I'm still mad at you. Here's a picture. Like, what is yeah. going on? Like, he, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And How I'm going to send it to mom sick. for the mom who apparently doesn't want a relationship with the son either. So, like, what then the hell what are you doing? Oh, God. That's the mom's I have fault. so many anyway, questions about she did, that. She did, she did not elaborate. Her lawyers argued in court in front of the Texas Supreme Court, like, hey, the U.S. Supreme Court already said it's okay for a Colorado website designer what? who didn't want to make wedding websites for gay couples. Like, the Supreme Court already sided with her. Mm. And remember, this is the case where no gay couples actually asked her to make any wedding websites for Mm -hmm, them. That was a lie. mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. But obviously, there's a difference between a private business owner and a government official. So I don't get why her attorneys tried to make that analogy. Uh, Um, But if the Texas Supreme Court... But at this point, you can draw... You can connect dots any which way if the Supreme Court agrees with you. Sure. I mean, look, if the Texas Supreme Court takes her side on this one... What is stopping other judges from using religion as an excuse to deny justice to any other potential people? And, like, there's no reason. Nothing. There's no reason the judges should rule in her favor. Again, they could cop out of this by just saying, look, it was tossed out on a technicality, right. the sovereign immunity thing. Take we're just L, we're yeah. going to take that out, and we're not going to rule on the merits. They could do that. I don't think they will. It's Republican court. Um, but mm. there's no reason to think justice, basic human decency will win out here. No. The only hope I guess we have is that they'll limit the damage they cause or choose to uphold the earlier correct decisions. Maybe cross your fingers. I don't that know. brother stalking is really I creepy. swear that was the highlight of that article where I'm like, what the hell is happening in her life? Not to be too conspiratorial, but do we know his cause of death? No, I don't. Okay. I don't. Christ, that poor man. Seriously. Although, it sounds like he really... What did you say? Paris, Dubai? He went all over the place, Good man. Good for him, man. Right. It's a life. That's all I got for you. That's all you Where got do we find you? you? I don't know. Um, you can go to patreon.com slash friendly atheist podcast to support this show. Um, my Kickstarter for the Revelation series is still up for another week. Mm-hmm. Um, that link is in the show notes if you are so inclined to support it, and we'll stick your name in the credits as a thank you. Yep, and we can all, you can always leave us a review. Do I have any new ones? Ooh, this one is one star. Yes. Want to like this show? This could actually be a great show if Jessica didn't sing, laugh, or talk. Maybe he <laughs> should just do the show alone. Oh, well, I will keep looking for another show. But I'm going to first from stop to write something nasty. Be 82nd. That's fun. All um, right. Uh, listen, oh, uh, go leave us five-star reviews to offset that dude who yeah. doesn't listen to our show. Um, on the bonus episode, I want to talk to you about a couple of things. One, oh, you know, I just recorded today, um, Your Therapist Needs Therapy. I was a guest on that podcast. That should be coming out all the, later in the month, I think. Um, I also listened to a true crime podcast series yesterday called Ghost Story, and I really need to talk to somebody about it and good good news you're here excellent um and also if we have time um i'm not finished with it but fall of the house of usher is blowing my mind it's so fucking good i can't believe it all right we'll see you next week goodbye